Hi, I'm Stanley Goldberg, host of the Inquiring Mind podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you're new here, I release two episodes a week with a variety of fascinating guests. And I would appreciate if you would support my podcast by liking this video and subscribing down below. Thank you for your support. And now to today's guest. David Sachs, welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. Thank you, Stanley. Um, so first and foremost, I, I read your book on audio as I was just trying to show you before we started. I couldn't put it into focus on my phone. Um, but the soul of an entrepreneur, work and life beyond the startup myth. <clears throat> I think I think it came out what last year? Um uh, two, years, uh, two ago? years. Yeah, I get yeah. Two yeah. years ago almost, right at the beginning yeah. of the pandemic, like huh? right at the beginning of the pandemic. Well, there you go. Um yeah. So first, I wanted to say that when I first got your book, I honestly thought it was going to be one of those how to become an entrepreneur kind of books. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised that it was not that because those books get very old very quickly because you realize that all people have different paths to getting to where they get to. Um, so let me just start with the most, the simplest question, the one that you probably get a million times is, why did you decide to write the book? Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, I decided to write the book because uh, all I was seeing was what you were talking about, which is, you know, one, one uh, writer, Maura Aaron's Malay, um, uh, who now hosts a podcast. Uh, she wrote in a Harvard Business Review article uh, talking about the rise of entrepreneur porn. I mean, there's just so much of that out there that there's been this explosion of of interest and mythology and content around entrepreneurs. And it all just kind of fell into the same category, which is like, you know, how I did this and how I'm successful and how you can become successful too. Um, and most of it was concentrated around this mythology of kind of the Silicon Valley style startup. You know, these two young Harvard alumni have started this makeup company and they're disrupting the space and they just raised a hundred million dollars. And, you know, now they're on the Ted talk circuit and blah, blah, blah. And like, this is what entrepreneurship is and this is what it's about. And, and, um, and as someone who had written about entrepreneurs for my entire career as a writer and a business journalist, um, and always taking an interest in sort of entrepreneurs and individuals and small businesses, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't see the majority of the people and businesses and entrepreneurs I had known and written about or knew in my own life from my wife to my family, you know, my parents, my brother, myself, who's always worked for himself. Like I didn't see that reflected in any of that content. Um, so there was this sort of mythology of the 0.1% who were the ones that we were holding up and glorifying and deifying um, the Steve Jobs is the, you know, Elon Musk's and Travis Kalanick's and, you know, the Adam Newman's and, um, and Elizabeth Holmes's and, and the various other ones. Um, but, you know, there was never anything about, oh, well, what about the person who started the coffee shop at the end of my street uh, and who runs a successful business and supports herself and her family and is beloved by the community and is really given back to it? Like, where do they fall into that? What about the person who has a lifestyle business? What about the person who, struggles but hasn't failed but you know it's it's difficult for them and, and what is the challenge like for them um what's the reality of what being an entrepreneur is actually about and what is the deeper meaning of it beyond starting something and disrupting the world and making a billion dollars which very few if any entrepreneurs actually got to do i mean talking about you know it's like writing a book about I don't know, basketball and only talking about uh, Michael Jordan and um, LeBron James. Whereas like there are millions and millions of people who like to play basketball and what's that actually like for them? Yeah. And I think it's the same thing. You don't even have to write about the guy that's, you know, um, the 12th man on the basketball team. And the, that person is still an exceptional athlete because how yes. many people actually make it to the NBA how about the person that like was, you know, a top recruit from high school, went to play for a top college and never made it to the NBA? Like that's those are real stories that happen every single year. It's, yet we still only care about LeBron James and the star. Yeah, the, yeah. the exceptions. Um, and so we kind of made the exception, the rule. 
and um, and built this mythology around it, which, you know, it, it created this interesting dynamic, this paradox in a way, right? Because in the one sense, you're you're mythologizing entrepreneurship. You're making it sexier and cooler than ever before, but you're, you're doing it in a way that no way reflects the reality of what being an entrepreneur is. Um, one academic I interviewed uh, about it, you know, compared it to uh, all the biologists in the world only writing papers about elephants, whereas elephants are like a fractional percentage of, you know, the, the living species on this planet. And, and really what's more significant is studying ants, um, because ants have a much greater impact on the world and the biomass and the soil and the air and the health of an ecosystem than elephants or tigers or other big sexy animals, because nobody's selling uh, my kid a stuffed animal of an ant. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting point. What I what I noticed is very I, small stuffed animals, tough to sell. Tough <laughs> yeah. to sell. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a world, I think, uh, where I knew about these people from a very young age. I knew who Steve Jobs was, I knew who Mark Zuckerberg was, I knew who um Bill Gates was, you know, and there is a lifestyle attached to what they were talking about and what they were trying to sell you. You know, Steve Jobs walked out in the the T-shirt and the jeans, and I'm like, uh, but aren't you rich? Aren't aren't you supposed to be driving like a Lamborghini or something like that? Like as a kid, that's what you're thinking. Mark Zuckerberg with his T-shirt and the like, it all kind of looked the same because they yeah. they dressed exactly the same. Um, Bill Gates is slightly different, I, I think he. He, wore- he had an older style, but he's, you know, he's like, his was the cardigan and the, the he yeah, kind yeah. of had the Mr. Rogers look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you mentioned early in your book, which I, which I found really interesting is that in past generations, like nobody had a poster of the founder of Intel uh, on their wall yet. <laughs> the Gordon yet, Moore poster. No. Yeah. yeah but was- yet, yet millions of people around the world have posters of Steve Jobs of, of Bill Gates and of Mark Zuckerberg on their wall, which I think is kind I of I hope creepy. no one has creepy. a poster of Mark Zuckerberg on their yeah. wall. That's a fucking awful. I'd rather have a poster <laughs> of Stalin on my wall, to be honest. Um, and I would not have a poster of Stalin on my wall, I assure you. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think this, this again, was this mythology. And, and so much of this, listen, you know, when you go back to the Gilded Age of, of the early 20th century um, and the sort of rise of, of robber baron capitalism, I mean, you know, John Jacob Astor and Andrew Carnegie. Um, these people were revered at the time as these godlike figures because of their success in business, regardless of what they did or the or the, or the bad things they had done in, in their businesses. Um, and I think that there was that same sense of of reverence. I see the great Gatsby poster in the background of your thing. I mean, that's that's the heart of it, right? That's that's basically what Fitzgerald was writing about. Um uh, you know, I think the difference is it, it, over the past couple decades, you know, especially Silicon Valley until very recently was kind of seen as this like exceptional bright shining light of American capitalism, where the other aspects of American capitalism that were once revered had really fallen out of public favor, right? you know, where previously we would have worshipped, you know, the railroad barons, we saw that the bad that they did, the steel barons like Carnegie, um, where previously, you know, corporate America was kind of the the shining beacon, um, uh, General Motors and the Ford Motor Company and Coca-Cola, you know, Dow Chemical by, by you know, the time of the Vietnam War um, and, in, you know, into the 80s, that was, you know, the, the, these were like the big evil corporations that were trying to take everything from you and anywhere work for them was sort of a soulless madman. Um, you know, Wall Street lost its favor in the 1980s with uh, that the sort of stock market-based greed and the area of Reaganism. Um, and, and then this sort of push towards the corporations. Again, like even the cool corporations like MTV or whatever, you know, in the 90s were sort of losing their veneer. Um, and so what you have is like, but this world of tech, like, these people are giving you the things that you like. They're giving you the computer that you work with, the phone in your hands. They're changing the world. They're doing it while they're cool. They're not sacrificing their ideals. And hey, they're making a shit ton of money doing it. Like, look at this 22-year-old kid who just became a billionaire out of his dorm room in a year. Isn't that amazing? Who wouldn't want that? I mean, 
Disney can't write a, a fantasy as wonderful as that, right? Um, uh, and it's just this incredibly compelling thing that is so much more of a powerful, tantalizing character and force than, um, you know, a more balanced and nuanced story about the reality of something, which is like, let's put a poster up of the guy who owns the restaurant around the corner. Um, uh, you know, it's not as sexy as Steve Jobs, right? I mean, the guy had like five movies made about his life. You know, Gandhi had one. A good one. A better movie, yes. to be fair. Yeah, I was, I was, that's what I was trying to say. It's... But perhaps Ben Kingsley will get back in the role of Steve Jobs. He's got the hair for it. So. Yeah, yeah. I, that's an interesting um, kind of analysis. But I think also if if some of the cases that you bring up in, in your book were more popular, say, like you're knowing who owns and started like the local coffee shop or opened up a, a bookstore, or opened up is would make people more likely to want to be an entrepreneur or want to start a business and prosper. I think sometimes it's it's the same thing as like looking at LeBron James and being like, I could be a basketball player, but if you're, you know, five, eight and uh, don't have a insane wingspan and can jump, you know, into the rim. Uh, you're describing someone I know. <laughs> yeah, you're you're, you're like, yeah, you're like you're I a five eight Jewish author. Um, <laughs> you're medium like, weight. Yeah, you're like I, I can't make it to the NBA. But if you you know kind of set a more realistic expectation of you know Brian Scalabrini, I don't know. I'm just trying to pick a random name from a pot, but uh, I think. Scalp no, yeah, a no. random name of someone who I hated in high school. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think knowing these local business owners makes you more likely to want to start a business. And I think that the, the, the startling thing about your book is that my generation, technically, um, the millennial generation, I'm like right on the border of that and whatever comes next, which is like Gen Z or whatever. Um, and, um, we're less likely to to be entrepreneurs, even though we grew up in a world where entrepreneurship was sold to us. Yeah. And that's one of the facts I learned very early on when I was started to, to do research into this that, that really shocked me. Um, you know, a couple of years before I wrote the book, I was talking with a friend of mine, Greg Kaplan, who's a, a professor of economics at University of Chicago. Um, at the time, he was at Princeton. We were having breakfast in New York. And I was saying, you know, I want to write a book about this sort of golden age of entrepreneurship we're living in, because I had kind of seen it. And, you know, I was living in New York at the time. You know, every subway ad was about starting a startup. WeWork was happening. It was There was this buzz around entrepreneurs. Um, and I was like, this is great. More people are starting businesses. And this is awesome. He's like, well, have you, have you looked into that? I was like, yeah, well, look, look at all the startups, you know, it's amazing. He's like, well, you know, let me send you something. And he sent me papers and stats, which is like, here's the, you know, from the day I was born in 1979 until now, like the number of individuals who had started to work for themselves and were starting businesses in the United States and other Western countries have been steadily declining um, uh, since the day that Reagan came into office, basically. And, and, and it had still continued this downward trajectory and it sort of startled me. And I think it was when you start looking beyond the elephants and start looking at the, the, the greater population of the ecosystem um, and its health and, and, and looking at the ants, you really saw this sort of deeper picture. Um, and I think that's, that was that, that line of inquiry that sort of drive me to see like, well, how is it that we're talking about entrepreneurship so much, but it's actually in the aggregate been declining and it, and in most of these sectors even in the tech sector it had been you know fewer people were starting companies fewer people were going out to work but on their own um what was behind that right and um and 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 i think a big part of it was this detachment from that reality you know uh the cult you know there were economic factors at play there was factors about employment there's factors about interest rates there's all these sorts of reasons there's no it's not exactly known why this was happening. There's no clear answer. But I think one of them was this cultural question, which gets back to our sort of basketball analogy, which is like, you know, if the standard of success you're going for is LeBron James, then most people are not going to do it. But, you know, if, if all of a sudden you can say, well, you know, I could be like Brian Scalabrini. I mean, you know, 
Brian went, you know, he, he, he made the, the team in high school and he, you know, he, he, he played in college a bit and he, I still see him at the Y occasionally. And, you know, Brian's looking good. I saw him do a jump shot the other week and he hit like, I don't know, four out of five of those threes um, and his knees are in good shape. So like, yeah, maybe I should pick up the ball again too. Right. Go, go Brian. Um, and I, and I think that's, that is, you know, that, that cultural conversation that I wanted to have and to do that. And, and, and the kind of idea was like, well, let's actually get and break down the mythology of it and get at what the reality of being an entrepreneur is like, because I think if people understand what the reality of being an entrepreneur is like, what that really means beyond just changing the world or making a ton of money, they'll have a better appreciation of, of the risks and the rewards of it. Um, and maybe that might help them you know, if not start something, then at least have a clearer idea of what it looks like and why they would do it. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, uh, I think it was in one of your interviews or maybe in your book, I'm, I'm confusing the two because they're both audio, so I can't really separate the two. Um, but you mentioned that the last time you got a quote unquote paycheck from a, you know, an employer was like 1999 and, or am I correct in that analysis? 98. 98. Uh, no. Yeah. Teaching skiing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so 2000, 90, 99, 99. Yeah. Um, so it's been a golden era of employment. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 23 years that you've um, now oh, not God. had uh, a boss with this like gainful stent- employment. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how do you, how do you view that kind of the difference between the two lifestyles of having that, the kind of job, the nine to five maybe, or, whatever the hours are eight to four or, um, and, and working for yourself and, you know, staying in sweatpants and and doing your, and writing your books. Bro. (laughs) Team team Uniqlo. (laughs) Um, I'd like to thank my sponsor Uniqlo. Uh, if only good Lord, if only they could sponsor me. Um, you know, this gets back to the definition of what an entrepreneur is. So that was one of the interesting things when I first started doing interview for this book, I was interviewing academics, professors of entrepreneurship at you name it university, right? Around the world. And I I remember one of the early ones that the guy who was like founded the entrepreneurship program at Harvard. And he said, well, what do you mean by entrepreneur? And I was like, well, you know, entrepreneur. He's like, well, what do you mean by that word? And I was like, that's a really good question. Um, He gave me his definition. And when I started asking at the beginning of every interview I did, whether it was the professor of entrepreneurship or whether it was a, a farmer in California or someone who had started a multi-million dollar uh, medical device business in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, or, or a, someone who graduated Stanford, become a venture capitalist in Palo Alto. Um, I said, how do you define an entrepreneur? And no one gave me an identical definition. And it was really interesting because that cultural divide that we talked about That really played itself out in the definition. If someone was in the world of venture capital and startups and 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 really enraptured in that mythology, it was very much along the lines of a dreamer, an innovator who starts a you know wild new invention or product and changes the world and makes a lot of money and you know receives venture capital funding. And it was like, yes, 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 I get that. Um, And other people had different definitions. So I went back and and did research. And in the research, which, you know, wasn't the easiest thing to find, um, the word is a French word, and it comes really kind of in the Middle Ages, it means, entrepreneur means basically like someone who does, a a doer, essentially, is is the direct translation of what the word is. Um, But it was in the, in the, in the, you know, 17th century, or sorry, like 1730, there's a French Irish economist in um, Paris, uh, Richard Cantillon. And uh, Rick Cantillon um, uh, writes a book about essays about the economy. Uh, it's really like one of the first modern works sort of defining economics um, that's sort of there for public consumption, not just an academic thing. And, um, and Cantillon, in one of the chapters, talks about the entrepreneur. And he says, you know, there are two types of people in this world. There are those who work for a given wage for someone else, and everyone else is an entrepreneur. 
And the entrepreneur is basically anyone who works for an unfixed wage and, you know, and receives an uncertain reward and an uncertain time and takes the risk to do that in the hope of some greater payoff. And that was everyone from the wealthy merchant who was, you know, launching expeditions and ships across the ocean to try to, you know, get some big trade deal and risking it all to like the poor farmer uh, who was taking his pumpkins to market to the beggar in the street. And he literally says this. And, you know, that definition I found really actually encompassed what I realized what entrepreneurs were, which is myself, uh, my father who owned a business, my brother who's starting like a, he's doing a space mining business now, raising venture money and all sorts of different investment money, right? Very much in that definition of, you know, he's mining on the moon. Um, my wife who works for herself as a career coach and had started that business a couple of years ago, but does it more as a lifestyle thing. She wants more time with our kids. Um, sort of everyone who works for themselves, who doesn't have that boss, who doesn't get that paycheck is an entrepreneur. And the reason why, and this goes back to what Contillon says is, they they share two things, all entrepreneurs, right? Freedom and risk. Freedom is what you get as an entrepreneur. When you go out to work by yourself, whether you are a freelance writer or podcaster, I, I don't know if Stanley, if this is what you do full-time or you have another job, full-time? Yeah, What's I, your yeah. other, a paid job? Yes. For, what do you do? Oh, I'm a, a soccer coach. Awesome. Well, well all my metaphors with the wrong sport. <laughs> it, Stanley. We could have said messy the whole time. Um, um, uh, so the freedom to do what you do, right? Uh, which is that, you know, I can wake up when I want, I can write whatever books and articles I want. If I decide tomorrow to start writing about soccer, I could do it if, if I can make it happen. Um, I could take off whatever vacation days I want. I'm, I am, I, I set my agenda. Nobody tells me what to do. And that is the one thing as an entrepreneur, regardless of your level of financial success, you always have the ability to make those decisions. No one's going to tell you what to do um, for better or worse. That's your freedom. That's what you gain out of it. The cost of that is the risk, the risk that A, what you do won't be successful and you won't be able to pay the bills and make money. Um, but B, also these other risks, the risk to your sense of self-worth, to your ego, to your family, to your life, to your time, all the other risks that come with taking on the burden of that freedom. Um, and really, this was that sort of unifying thing that I realized, like, this is what links all entrepreneurs. And when you talk to them, regardless of their level of financial success, regardless of their industry, regardless even of where they are, their geography, that that is something that they all had in common. They all kind of shared the same hopes and dreams and problems and issues um, that the, that each other had, regardless of who they were or what they were doing. And that that was sort of that inkling of, oh, there's there's this communal soul to the entrepreneur, which was, you know, obviously the title of the book. Yeah, I, I think what entices a lot of people to want to be entrepreneurs is that freedom aspect uh, where I can wake up. I don't have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning to go to my job that starts at whatever time they start work. Um, I don't have a commute. I mean, unless you own an office or something, but if you work from home, I don't have a commute. I just sit down and I do. And stuff. if you own the office, you decide where you want the office. Like the office, I have friends who work in distant suburbs. I'm like, why the hell are you going to work there? It's like, oh, the boss lives nearby. You know? <laughs> no, well, there you it's go. like, oh, well, that <laughs> sucks. Uh, but I would imagine, you know, I, I actually spoke to a, a very famous uh, historian named Andrew Roberts, who wrote about World War II, writes about World War II, has a great biography of uh, Winston Churchill. Um, and I asked him, like, what is your day to day like? You know, and it's interesting when that, that question is rarely asked of a person that has a, a job, right? Because you kind of assume, you know, they show up to the office at nine o'clock. They, you know, make themselves a cup of coffee or, or some tea. And I, I mean, I've been through this. So I kind of like know what people do. They sit down at their desks. They like open their emails. They, I don't know, answer some emails and they spend more time answering emails. And Morning, Rich. Morning, Brian. How's the basketball game? Oh, you know how it is. Yeah. <laughs> so making small talk punch, with you. Yeah. Punch, yeah. punch that clock. Yeah. They, they attend some meetings, you know, they go to lunch. And then they come back from lunch and answer some more emails. And then they come back and the day's over. Um, so <laughs> that really sounds like a dream. Honestly. <laughs> but I would imagine a person like you gets the question from, I don't know, 
family, but definitely, you know, friends would be like, well, what do you do with your time? Like, yeah. What do you, when do you wake up? Like, it's so fascinating for a person that's, that, that has that nine to five to, right. to, to think like, what do you do? Cause their, their time is paid for, right? They are being paid for their time. Sure. Their time is what, you know, they have surrendered the freedom and lower their risk. And in doing that, their time is owned by someone else. Now, depending on your job, like it is a very specific time. Like you come to work from nine till five and we will pay you for these hours of work. And, you know, if you work overtime, you'll get this much and whatever. And other people, it's like, well, the job's kind of nine to five, but you know, uh, you know, you got to be available on weekends and whatever. They're up at like three in the morning answering emails from the boss. Um, uh, but it's, you know, it's like, well, you know, we're, we're paying, we're not paying you to take vacation, you know, well, you're going on vacation, but we'd like you to take your laptop. Um, uh, yeah, but th there is the, that fascination. I mean, I found that with my friends, you know, even recently, like, what do you do all day? What do you do? You know? And, and it's funny. It's like, well, some days I'm like traveling and speaking and interviewing people and I'm going to California. And I, you know, I was recently in this, you know, for this book, it's like, well, I was at this ranch in California. I was riding on the back of an ATV with the guy's son, you know, interviewing in between rounding up cattle and whatever, and getting a sense of the scene. And then, you know, and then I spent like three months at home, like, you know, pretty much, I don't know, dropped the kids off at school, wrote for a couple of hours, had some lunch, wrote for a couple more hours, picked the kids up at school, maybe wrote a little bit at night or, or did something, whatever. Like that was, that was four months of that as opposed to a couple months of editing. And then it's like, and then I had some weeks where, I don't know, I went like paddle boarding and, you know, I don't know, I went grocery shopping in the middle of the day and I went for a long lunch with a friend, like it's so random and scattershot. Um, but again, it's like, well, I'm the one who decides it. And if I'm not working and, and I'm not making money, like I'm not making, making money, but it's no one's paying me to do these things or not do these things. Um, so that, that, that idea of time is such a, such a, um, a construct of like how we built the world of work, right? We built it around time. And, uh, and when no one's paying you for your time, it's, it's very hard for people to, to wrap their head around that. It's, it's a hard thing for people who've become entrepreneurs from the world of, you know, employment and corporate work. Um, it's a lot of them have a difficult time with that. They, they really just do not know, like one is the fear of getting paid for it. But the other is like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, it's, it's 10 a.m. I don't have anything to do. What do I do? It's like, I don't know, go out for a walk, go go to the gym, do, do something, go for, go play soccer, go Brian's at the basketball thing, you know, Brian, was it yeah. Brian? Yeah, Brian. So the, the, yeah, I agree with you. Like I, so before this job, I, I actually spent, I think a year, working these odd like freelance jobs and you know getting that unsteady paycheck that you refer to um and that exact scenario where you like what do i do with my time i i had that like i realistically felt i need i need some structure like i need to know when i have to wake up like it's it's a weird it's a weird concept i i feel like Whenever but you started a podcast, right? You're like, all right, I got this. Is what I'll do with my time. Yeah, and I, I, by the way, the reason I started a podcast, I, I had this fear for a very long time of starting one, and then I was like, I'm gonna start on a whim. I was just like, I'm gonna start a podcast because what do I have to lose? Like, and then I had all this time to interview people, to do research for it, and and I felt like, okay, I need to keep adding things to do to fill up my time because that's what I would be doing if I, when I worked in an office job, like I did things during the day. I can't remember half the things I did during the day, but somehow I was busy all the time. So I feel like I have to be busy again. And the hardest thing to do was being like, can I take a lunch break now? Like, can I, can I leave the house? Can I, can I go for a walk? Like, what do I do? Yeah. Can I enjoy the freedom that I've, that I've sacrificed for and take the risk on? Yeah. It's a scary um, thought. Yeah. And like, will I be lesser if I do enjoy it? You know, do I feel, I mean, it, 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 I, I know people, it's taken them years to get over that guilt of doing it. And it's like, well, I can't, I can't go, you know, I can't go paddleboarding with you in the middle of the day. It's, you know, it's the middle of the week. I should be working. It's like, well, if you don't have any work to do now and it's a beautiful July day and it's like 85 degrees outside, no. you don't have anything to do and your kids are at school who 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 are you asking permission for who cares no one's gonna fire you you know 
I don't know. That's that, it's still frightening to me. I feel like if I had to do it again, like knowing what I know now, I would definitely just put in certain rules for myself. Like I would, right. I would get up at a certain time, not, oh, I feel like sleeping in today. No. Yeah. That, One that day was... you'll have kids and that'll just be over. <laughs> that'll just, that party life will be behind yeah, you. Yeah. But, but, but it wasn't even, the thing is I just stayed up really late, like for right. no reason. I didn't do anything right uh, of of real you know worth I don't know worth yeah and then I just woke up like one day I'd wake up at a nine one day I'd wake up at like 11 I'm like oh, oh what this, a dream like this sucks <laughs> yeah. um but um I do want to ask like you mentioned that your dad was a small business owner right uh was- yeah I mean he was a he was a lawyer. He trained as a lawyer. He uh-huh. worked at a law firm for one year to get his license and then started on his own. He started, you know, his own practice. He had one or two partners over the years, but it was always sort of on his own. Stopped practicing law, did sort of investments um, and just kind of did his own thing and still does that. That's kind of just still does his own thing. Um, so, yeah. Um, how did your early life shape your view of entrepreneurship? Well, I think because of that, um, seeing him, because my grandfather had owned a, his own company, he owned a tool company, like a screwdriver company in Montreal with his brother, um, you know, it was working for yourself, starting something for yourself was not only something that was normal to me, um, but it was something that was kind of encouraged. Like even when I started out in journalism and I was applying for jobs right after college, and nobody was giving me a job because I had no real experience. And, you know, my dad's like, well, why don't you just try freelancing? Like, just and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. He's like, well, yeah, just if you could sell something, do it. Like, it was always this idea of like, why don't you just try doing it yourself? You know, see if you can do it yourself. What's the worst that happens? Nothing happens. Like, you'll, you'll be fine, you know? Um, uh, and, and, you know, part of that's privilege. Part of that's the fact that of like, look, like, you know, you can live here. Well, you know, we'll help you with rent. If things don't work out, worst case scenario, you're not going to go hungry. Right. Um, which not everybody has. And I am very clear to acknowledge that. Uh, and that's a big part of that startup myth too, of like Mark Zuckerberg started everything on his own. It's like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Like Mark Zuckerberg pretty, you know, he had a nice landing pad to come from. So like, was already and, at Harvard. And Bill Gates had a computer in his school when nobody in the country had like a computer. Right. In his school. Yeah. yeah. So um uh but um you know I I it's it's again that mentality of like oh this is something that I can do. Mm-hmm. Like this is this is possible. This is this is the behavior that's modeled to me. Whereas other people I know whose families grew up in you know were very opposite. Like their parents worked in banks and law firms and insurance companies and you know, it's not like mid-century Japan where it's like you work for Toyota and you will work there the rest of your life and you'll get your gold watch on retirement. YouTube will do it, son. Um, but there was this idea of like, well, this is what normal life is, right? This stability, um, you, you, you know, you work hard and you work your way up and like, this is the thing. And I, and I know many people who, who came from that background and, and follow that. I also know people who it was the opposite. The one, you know, their parents were very stable and very bored in their thing. And they really wanted to become entrepreneurs. They wanted the opposite. And other people whose family were entrepreneurs and they're like, this was crazy, unstable. My parents went through so many bankruptcies and, you know, wacky ideas. I just, I want the opposite of that. Like I want to, I want a government job unionized. Like I want stability and predictability. And I, so much of that comes down to just people's personalities. Right. Yeah. Um, one of my my girlfriend is studying to be a dentist. She's in dental school now, and one lucky of her, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of my uh, one of her former bosses. Uh, we went to like a some kind of party for work. Dental uh, and party. They're a dental party. <laughs> they they know how to have fun. Um, so and I spoke to well, he's actually my dentist too, and I just spoke to him. And I was like, you know, what do you, do you want your kids to be a dentist? And he goes, no, I, he goes, I'm not pushing anything. Like it worked for me. It won't necessarily work for them. But one thing he said uh, that kind of changed my, like, I remember thinking about it for the next like few weeks and going, well, whoa, that's, that's an interesting point. He goes, the one thing I always tell my kids is uh, I want them to work for themselves. Mm-hmm. I, and I don't, like my, my parents came from the former so- Soviet Union, like 
I mean, they couldn't really work for themselves because, you know, that's not a thing. Uh, but they work, you know, jobs, proper jobs, I guess, whatever. And then they came to this country and they, again, they had to make ends meet and they worked jobs. So whenever I was of age, I was like, you know, what I need to do, I, I need to get a job and I need to get like multiple jobs. And you get this, especially in New York, you have this like almost hustle mentality where you just have to keep going and going and going and going and going. Um, so that was never instilled in me, but I think I definitely want to accomplish what the, the dentist laid out where he said that, you know, you should aim to work for yourself because, you know, you don't want to go through life being told what to do all the time. Interesting. Yeah. I, it's, I, it's interesting because I know a lot of people and entrepreneurs, um, that I've talked to over the years who had come from, um, the former Soviet Union or other communist countries, Cubans in Miami, um, you know, Vietnamese immigrants um, uh, who came after the war and you know, had, had, had fled from the encroaching communism. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, 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 it's interesting that it was almost the opposite, right? It was like, this is the thing that we weren't able to practice. And so like, no, we're not working for anyone. We are going to, you know, the value is, is, is that independence and freedom at all costs. Um, uh, and again, it, it all just comes down to people's individual circumstances and temperament and, and, um, and, you know, where random circumstance takes them in life. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting in the way that, that you frame it is like entrepreneurship is, it becomes a value, right? A value that is completely divorced from what industry it's in or the path or the actual level of financial success. It's more like it is, it is the freedom itself is the value. And this is something that you should value, or you should at least try to see what the value of that is, I, I guess is what that dentist was saying. Yeah. Like he probably wasn't saying, I never want any of my kids to work for anyone else, but it's like, I want them to try. I want them to have that experience of feeling it, um, to know for themselves whether that's something that they, they would want or not. And it's, yeah, you know, I don't know a lot of people who have done it and, and, and like consistently, and then like eventually like, well, yeah, I'm taking a job at a bank for the next 20 years or whatever. Like it's, it's hard when you've had that freedom um, to, to sort of give it up and to yeah. go back for that check. Yeah. I think those checks, that check is what you and I get once right. in a while. Right. After uh, hounding them hmm. to send it. Uh, the, the interesting, again, um, dynamic here is that even if you work say a nine to five or eight to four or whatever the hours are um you have less freedom because during that period of time the eight hours that you're at work or 10 hours whatever you're you have to do essentially what your boss is what your company wants you to do so you sacrifice some freedom but the the other part of the day you can set aside to starting a a project of your own, you know, you could start a podcast, you could write a blog. I think what I've always found is that I know some very, very talented people. I'm, I'm actually thinking of just one in particular who I worked with in the past, who is, uh, he's a graphic designer, insanely talented. Um, and I was always like, hey, go f do freelance. Like you're one, you're going to make more money. And two, you're just ridiculously talented. And he would always be hesitant he's like but how about my health insurance and and you know and and those are legitimate concerns but i'm like dude you don't have a like you don't have kids and and like things like that to worry about you could literally go back and live with your parents for a couple of years while you get this up and running and then you have enough clients and then you can get a bigger apartment than you had while you had a job but that's a, a difficult difficult sell for the parents yeah, yeah. once you're like you can go back and move with your parents the, the sales pitch is over I'm sorry <laughs> yeah. that's just yeah. you're not winning that one that, yeah that's true um what so the, first step move in with your parents <laughs> well, one of the the craziest things about um that was in your book and then when, when you you kind of wrote down what i used to think so i went to a school that was very centered around business and uh, a lot of people went on to work in accounting and finance for my school. 
Um, like a New York City, yeah, like a Baruch, public school? It's a CUNY, yeah. So Baruch, okay. Baruch College. Um, it's a, yeah. It's like NYU, in New York, it's like NYU Stern, Baruch's yeah. business school, and like whatever other business schools there are. But um, Yeshiva what, business school. Yeah, sure. Not <laughs> um, uh, Yeshiva the, University, literally a Yeshiva that's a business school <laughs> in, in, uh, in Borough Park. Um, but one of the interesting thing is there's this rise of entrepreneurship departments. And I remember yes. that being a thing in my school and I go, well, that's kind of dumb. Like, I, I remember thinking that I'm like, isn't an entrepreneur, somebody that like thinks of, and I has an idea and goes, I'm going to figure it out. Like, instead of taking classes as to how to become an entrepreneur, especially mm -hmm. in, in your book, you outline how people that are successful entrepreneurs teach these classes, but it's more, it's less like this is how you do it and more of like how I did it and uh, why you should do it too. And it's like an infomercial. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, that, that was one of the interesting things that, that, you know, that again, looking at that mythology, right. That the, and it was like in the early 1980s, there were, I don't know, a couple dozen entrepreneurship classes taught at universities around North America. Um, you know, the first department was at University of Arizona, I think. Uh, and it was, you know, in the, the mid to late eighties. And then as the startup boom happened, all this money started flowing toward it and universities realized like, oh, they could have an entrepreneurship faculty. They could raise money around that. It would be a sexy way to sell stuff. And it was just boom, 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 boom. And now every, not just university, but like community college, high schools. They have courses and faculties and whole buildings and whole campuses devoted to entrepreneurship. And it's all that one flavor of entrepreneurship, right? It is that the, the Silicon Valley model, the startup model, the venture or outside investor funded model um, with a few sort of side things. One might have like the social entrepreneurship. So it's like, yeah, you're going to do good and you're going to, you're not going to start a charity. You're going to start like a social entrepreneur business. And we have someone who's going to tell you about how they, if you sell one pair of shoes and you can donate a pair of shoes or whatever. Right. Um, but that really fortified and, and sort of codified that myth, while again, ignoring what, you know, 95% or 99% of people who are going to start businesses are doing, which is like, okay, you can get an education and you can learn many, many useful things if you're going to go out and start a shoe business or a lighting business or a soccer league business, let's say, like you were going to do, right? Um, there's many things that they could teach you about sales and marketing and accounting um, and, and all sorts of things that you'd be able to learn. And, and it would actually help you do that. But it's it's all just like, what's your business plan? Now we're going to do pitch day and you're going to stand up in front of a group of you know, rich investors, give them a two minute pitch and then they'll either give it to you the money or not. It's like, whoa, this is not how the world works. Like, how do I apply for a bank loan? How do I get, you know, how do I leverage a credit card? How do I, like, how do I actually do the things that I sort of need to do in order to make this happen in the real world? Um, but again, that doesn't sell. It doesn't sell magazines. It doesn't sell degrees at NYU Stern. Um, uh, and so it's like, well, we have, you know, the guy who founded Bonobos teaching a class this semester or whatever. I don't know if he does. Um, you know, we have this, you know, you know, Larry Ellison's going to give you a lecture of how to start a business. Like he's going to tell you how to buy an island in Hawaii, just like he did. How applicable is that to you? How applicable is that to like what your individual circumstances are? Um, it it's again, divorced from the reality of what being an entrepreneur is. Isn't that the majority of education though? Um, I, I, I'm like, as you're talking about it, I, I like, I'm thinking about it and I go, well, like there's a, the, the, I'm not sure it's an app, but it's a place you can watch videos, a masterclass. Right. right. Um, and I saw they promoted for the new year. They're going to have leadership lessons from Bill Clinton and like diplomacy lessons from Hillary Clinton. And then like something with George Bush and something with somebody else. And I, I'm right. just watching this. I'm like, <laughs> how to get in and out of a war in Iraq. <laughs> like, like, what? <laughs> like, what are you going to teach me in, in 90 minutes on masterclass? <laughs> but it's, it, it's a little, it's funny, but it's almost 
like I know how many people are probably going to sign up to masterclass be like Bill Clinton is going to teach me something. I'm like, yeah, because but he was president of the United States and you most, most of the yeah. things he he learned were on the job. Like he learned by trial and error. Like, oh, I have to talk to this person to do this. OK, cool. Right. This guy gets me that vote. He yeah. had no way of knowing that. And you can't learn that by watching a video. Or yeah. reading a, or reading his memoir, you can glean some lessons about you know character and whatever from reading different books about different um, historical figures. But until you're in the arena, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, so you're in the arena, like it's almost it's pointless. Like, but we have this culture that sells you names, especially I've seen this. Sorry for my like mini rant, but I've seen this in the publishing industry too. Like, especially in the self-help realm uh, where they have, you know, uh, how I started a business and you can too yeah. by fill in blank. By whoever. Like, yeah. Like Name started, it. started this big company that, you know, people admire for some reason. And I'm like, yeah, but, uh, but then when you actually read the books and I'm not like judging the books for existing, it's great that they are, are out there, but the person is just selling themselves. They're just saying like, this is how I did it. And I'm awesome because I started Bonobos. Uh, and you can do it too. And I'm like, no, that's not exactly how it works. You know, everyone is different, but it sells and it's going to keep selling. And it's frustrating that, um, yeah, I almost, I almost don't want to read those books anymore or ever see them. <laughs> Uh, because well, I mean, it's again, it's like you're not, you know, the idea is like you're going to learn something or you're going to be inspired. And maybe it's true. Maybe some, you know, how many bros have have read that <laughs> Steve Jobs, Walter Isaacson book a lot? And they're like, dude, this is, you know, bro, this is what I got to do. Like, I'm going exactly to be like Steve too. Jobs. It's like, I'm going to be an asshole. I'm going to be, I'm going to get divorced. Like, oh, yeah. did you read the Elon Musk book? Too? Like, he was, dude, he, he slept under his desk. I'm sleeping under my desk too. Like, it's like these are not the lessons that you need to be taking from this, you know. Um, uh, and again, everyone's circumstance is just totally different. There's there's so much of that survivorship bias where it's like the really successful guy who you know was the top one is the one that writes the story and everyone takes all the lessons from. But there's other people along the way that did it differently or or did it and failed and it wasn't their thing. And like you could probably learn a lot from them too. Uh, but again, it's it doesn't sell. It's not part of that mythology and the mythology is what sells and people want that. Yeah. Uh, the one guy I, 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 I really do love because I've, I don't know. I, I watched his videos for so long, but I, sometimes he just, he makes me laugh uh, is Gary Vaynerchuk. And I know you wrote speaking of former Soviet Hebrews. Yes. 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 Um, who's, you know, it was interesting. Like I, I used to write for a wine magazine when I, started well, as a journalist there you go. um and so i knew him from back in the, and i'm like this guy's amazing and then he kind of moved into the gary v world and universe and there's elements of him that's like yeah this guy is like he's that real scrappy entrepreneur he built up the parents business he did the thing you know and he he really does teach people in some senses that 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 idea and then he's like this guy is the king of entrepreneurship porn he's the he's the like no one slings it harder than he does oh yeah um, and that's his thing yeah, and the, the the whole like you can eat shit for ten years and you'll yeah. still, uh, and you'll still have your whole life ahead of you. I'm like, you know how hard that is to conceptualize. Like, so you're yeah. saying for the next ten years, uh, for the next three thousand days, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here and just suffer, and, and never do anything of anything. But then I'm gonna I I have a chance of starting something as successful as Gary Vee's business or the, right. the one thing that my friends and I are going to laugh about is he has this, this clip where um, he's sitting on stage and this woman, uh, I think it's a woman or a man, I don't know, asks him a question and goes, uh, so what advice would you have for somebody that's starting up in entrepreneurship? Like, I want to grow my business. And he literally goes, stop right there. Stop right there. This is what you have to do. Pick a person that you really love. And, you know, the, the woman's like, okay. Uh, he goes, and imagine they die right now. They're dead. 
And she goes, okay. He goes, just think about that. That gives you gratitude. Gratitude that they're still there. I'm like, what? It's literally like the self-help section of a bookstore distilled down into like a tweetable quote, you know? Yeah. <laughs> just imagine the person closest to you is dead. Um, I, I don't know. Well, good night. Thank you for coming <laughs> to my TED Talk. Yeah. Like, and Hope again, you're inspired. I, I think it's a love hate relationship that I have with him, but he's a he's yeah. a respect he's a, the game. Respect yeah, me too. Me too. Me yeah. too. Um, so I this this has been kind of fun. So I I do want to wrap up by asking you yeah. questions that I ask of all my guests at the end of every podcast, and I'll bundle them together, and you can answer sure. the first question first and whatever. Uh, so the first question is, what gives you hope for the future? If you have any hope. And the second question is, what are five books, fiction, nonfiction, that you would recommend to people? Mm. Well, first, I want you to picture someone you'd love. <laughs> My hope is that you'll still love that person. Uh, you know, I, I think, like, let's say from the entrepreneurship perspective, because um, if we're looking for hope in this today of this imminent World War Three Russian invasion and um, year two of COVID. Um, we'll just stick to the topic at hand. But, you know, I, I think over the past two years, you know, this, as I said, this book came out at the beginning of the pandemic. So like, there was the risk, you know, and, and the book, like, it was buried in the news, because like, this was like the beginning of everything. Um, but, uh, you know, what was interesting was I, I was talking about entrepreneurship at a time when like so many businesses, especially small businesses, were threatened and closing restaurants, bars, gyms, you know, local stores. Um, uh, and what's been amazing to me is there was this assumption like, well, this is it. The city is dead. These neighborhoods are dead. These stores are done. And like, for the most part, I mean, there were places to close, but like for the most part, places managed to stay and figure something out and get creative and get innovative. It it was this groundswell of, you know, real grassroots entrepreneurship. And you had people who, who left their jobs, who lost their jobs, who started these businesses. And it's just been, uh, it was actually was kind of amazing to see, um, to walk around the streets of my city, which is, I haven't left in two years. And see, like, in the midst of all this, you know, there's a there's an Indian-born French-trained pastry chef who was working at a restaurant that the restaurant closed, and he decided to open his croissant bakery that he'd been dying to do four blocks from my house, and it's the best croissants I ever had. And he, like, this was the thing that pushed him to take that risk. Um, people doing all sorts of different innovative ideas, you know, trying out different patios or different menus or, you know, completely changing their concept because they're like, well, I have the risk and I'm eating the shit of the risk right now because my business is closed. The government is mandated closed. So what can I do? Well, I also have the freedom to do whatever I want to do. I can do the freedom where the guy working at McDonald's doesn't have the freedom to do anything that he's, unless he's told what it is. Right. Um, and, and that was, that gave me hope. It gave me hope that like, Regardless of what happens, the entrepreneurial spirit, the, the soul of the entrepreneur will always, you know, be there and, and will rise up at the moments when it's when it's challenged the most. And that gave me a lot of hope. Um, five books. Uh, <clears throat> wow. OK, uh, let me think about those for a second. It's always a, a tough one to be put on the spot for. So I'm just going to name ones that um, I that uh I'll let you think, but the reason I do it and I yeah. try not to give people that warning that that question is coming okay. is because sometimes I, I like it lands really well and people yeah. are like, oh man, that's dude, that's something. amazing. And they, just, and they just shoot off number one, books. Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson, <clears throat> number two, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, number, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but number three, people, Elon Musk. Some people um, that love to read, obviously, and they read a lot yeah, of books yeah, for yeah. a living. I do love like, to read. Uh, you know, uh, fuck, yeah. Fuck. Um, you know, I, I like, it's interesting, like as much as people like, oh, do you read business books? I'm like, unless I have to read them for work, I don't. Um, you've got to want to read widely, you know, a book that a lot of entrepreneurs I know are really into and has opened up this whole new field is How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. I'm actually picking ones that my book club read over the past couple of years, which have been the best books. It's Yo, like, you have a book club as in like with friends or? Yeah, with friends. Yeah. Oh. Um, I highly recommend everyone do that. It's a lot of fun if you like to read. It is. It is. 
and drink. Um, <clears throat> uh, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan is kind of about the, the changing science of psychedelics and mental health. Um, a lot of business bros I know have read it and decided to start their own psychedelic companies or just do a lot of mushrooms. But um, it's an excellent book. And, and the thing about him is he's a science writer, but you know he approaches things and you see the possibility of these entrepreneurs who are trying to do these things. His other book, The On Divorce Dilemma, was about sort of the, the way we eat and food. And, and it, it gives you that bigger sense of that sort of bigger picture. It's, um, it's pretty amazing uh, and, and awesome. Um, another one that I'd recommend is uh, A Confederacy of Dunces, which is a classic American novel and is just like truly a rip-roaring, hilarious read if you want a book about entrepreneurs that is the genius and the brilliance and the darkness of that and not just this good empire of pain by patrick radden keefe which is a biography of the sackler family the people who brought you oxycontin and the opioid crisis um and were a brilliant family of doctors and business owners who did everything possible to get people addicted to these pharmaceuticals. Um, and it shows the, the drive of the entrepreneurial mind and the brilliance of it and the corruption of it and the sort of evil of it in one way. And it's an incredibly readable book. I just finished it about a week ago. Also a book club pick. Um, uh, that is a fantastic one. Um, Grapes of Wrath by Steinbeck classic American novel about the Dust Bowl, you know, you're talking about these farmers who had risked everything and their entire lives were tied up with their farm and it, they lost it all. The bank took it, the dust blew it away. They had to pick up their stakes in the Great Depression and and move. And, and it's, it's about the dislocation of a people, a people whose business and life is tied together. And I wrote about farmers in my book because they, they you know, as entrepreneurs, like their lives are, it's life, home and land and food all tied together with business. And um, you really get that, that, that deeper sense of that. Uh, and then was that five? I think four? so. I think so. Was it four? I think that was five with omnivores dilemma. Oh, okay. We can add an extra one. I'm trying to think of one that I read for the research for this book. Hold on. Let me just go into my notes here and see what I read for the research. Because there were some that were actually quite quite good, but just just hold on. I have my like sure. photos of the books I read. Are you a physical book album. guy or a- uh, Yeah, Kindle unless guy. I can get it. Um, unless I can get it. Hmm. Um, oh my God, yeah. The like, So, oh, yeah, what is it? It's, it's what I want. Okay. Um, you know, this is a classic book that a lot of entrepreneur bros will talk about and a lot of people in the conscious entrepreneur space. And it's, it's Let My People Go Surfing by Yvonne Chouinard, who's the guy that founded Patagonia. Um, uh, and, you know, it's, it's, off, you know, it's like if you read that top five list of entrepreneur books, it's always up there. But it is pretty great in the sense that it's like, here's how you build something that's different. And here's how you then take like some of the things and, and reckon with some of the, the the issues that have come around it and change that. Um, and, and I don't know, it's it it really stood up. I had I had kind of like skeptical expectations going into it, but it did, it did stand up, at least the first half of the book. The second half is kind of like pure Patagonia advertising, but you're preaching to the choir. Yeah. Um, so before we wrap up, is there anything you're working on now that you yes. can mention? Yeah, I have a new book coming out in um, this fall, November. Uh, it's called The Future is Analog. It's a sequel of sorts to a book I had that came out before. Um, Soul of an Entrepreneur called The Revenge of Analog, which was, I guess, my best-selling book. Um, and it, it really looks at the question of the future through the experience that we had of the pandemic, where for the entirety of my life, the future was going to be digital. Everything was going to be digital. Work, school, entertainment, community conversation. And then all of a sudden, two years ago, that arrived and we had to do everything for our screens. And so what do we learn about that? Um, and how can we build a future that's a little more human? 
Right, right. Uh, I look forward to reading that book and hopefully we can uh, chat about it on the podcast again. That'd be my pleasure, Stanley. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Take care.